Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the NUS Residential and Student Life Sharing Webinar. I'm Eunice, and I'll be your MC for today. Thank you for taking time to join us. Sharing you here this evening will be presented by the Dean of Admissions, Professor Goh Fei Song, and Dean of Students, Associate Professor Ho Han Kiet. After the presentations, there will be a QA segment with Prof Go, Prof Ho, and four NUS students. If you have any questions, we greatly appreciate if you could please write them down in the QA tab below, and we will answer them during the QA segment. Thank you for your patience. Professor Goh Fei Song is the Dean of Admissions at the National University of Singapore. A mathematician by training, he received his honours degree from the University of Oxford in 1988 and his master's and PhD degree degrees from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor in 1990 and 1992, respectively. He joined the NUS Department of Mathematics in 1994, and he is passionate about education and has received numerous teaching awards, including the University Outstanding Educator Award in 2009. His research interests are the theory and applications of wavelets, approximation theory, and harmonic analysis. And he also participates in interdisciplinary research involving the practical use of mathematics. Associate Professor Ho Han Kiet is the Dean of Students at the National University of Singapore and academic staff in the Department of Pharmacy. He received his Bachelor of Science with first class honors along with Lee Kuan Yew Gold Medal and Harmless Medal as a top graduate. Prof Ho became one of the pioneer recipients of the ASAR Overseas Graduate Scholarship and obtained his PhD in Medicinal Chemistry from the University of U Washington. Over the years, as a faculty member, he has published more than 90 papers in internationally recognized journals and has won multiple university-level teaching awards, including the Outstanding Educator Award in 2020. He was also recently recognized for his research by winning the 2020 Distinguished Alumni Award for Excellence in Pharmaceutical Sciences and Research, conferred by the University of Washington School of Pharmacy. Without further ado, let us begin the session. Prof. please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eunice, and a very good evening to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be here to welcoming all of you to NUS. Now, I believe that this is a really exciting time for you. You are going to enter NUS and there are a lot of interesting things awaiting you. So let me get my slides up first and then uh, I will give a brief introduction about this evening session and then I will share and bring the end then. And then after that, I'll pass the time to my good friend, Professor Ho Han Kiet, as well as our four student representatives. So this is now the very important moment. You are going to come towards the full NUS experience. You have been offered one of our more than 60 bachelor's degree programs, and you are now going to embark on your undergraduate education. Undergraduate education, if it's just academic, that is more than just academic. There's a lot more interesting things you can do and you can look forward to for your undergraduate education. For example, you can take part in our vibrant student life with more than 200 clubs and societies and interest groups on campus. You can consider staying on campus. There are four different types of on-campus accommodation. My, my, me and my colleagues, as I was the student representative, will explain to you what are these four different types of on-campus accommodation. And these four different types of on-campus accommodation spread over more than 15 different places uh, on our campus. At the same time, you can further enrich your university education. Apart from on-campus stay and student life, you can actually spend sometime in one of our more than 300 partner universities in more than 40 countries. You can try to be an entrepreneur, learn to be an entrepreneur and join our, one of our more than 15 NUS overseas colleges. At the same time, we take your future employment very seriously. So we make sure that most of our causes there is an internship component. It could be a uh, compulsory internship. It could be optional internship. And many of students have actually more than one internship. And that is where you get to marry what you have learned in the classroom to practical work, to experiential learning. So today's webinar, we're going to focus on two aspects. That is student life and on-campus state. And 
our student life is very vibrant. I assure you that when you come to NUS, you are going to find like-minded peers who will challenge you, who will cheer you on in different areas that you're interested in. It could be sports, it could be music, arts and culture, it could be community service, it could be special interest group that you have founded yourself. And like I said, we have four different types of on-campus accommodation. Let me explain to you what are these four types and then later on, uh, Prof Ho will tell you a lot more and the four students will actually share their experiences about their stay in these four different types of on-campus accommodation. The first type is what we call the Halls of Residence. Halls of Residence has been around for a long time since Cambridge campus in NUS. So if you have parents who are actually NUS graduates, probably some of them may have stayed in Shears Hall, Rifles Hall, Yushok Isha Hall. They have been around for a long time. And essentially, you will get a place to stay. At the same time, you will make friends and, and participate in all kinds of activities together with them uh, in terms of community activity, cultural activity, sports activities. So that is the horse of residence. More than 10 years ago, we started having residential colleges. It could be Richview Residential College, or it could be one of the residential colleges in university town, which I believe many of you visited during NUS Open Day. Now, in the residential colleges, again, you have a place to stay. You actually have lots of activities. At the same time, you take some classes uh, that can be counted towards your general education requirements there. And that is where you live you learn and you grow with peers and professors from faculties across campus. The number of classes, the number of module, uh, courses that you have to take at residential colleges uh, is about four. Now, how about NUS College? Some students actually has an offer from NUS College. Now, NUS College is, again, there's a place to, for you to stay. You take classes and there are lots of activities. The key difference is that while NUS College is also under the model of a residential college, but the number of classes that you have to take in, you take in NUS College is no longer four courses, but 14 courses. And that is where you have an immersive and interdisciplinary curriculum that can actually uh, replace quite a substantial portion of the common curriculum of your respective majors. Another type is what we call student residences. Student residences, you get a place to stay. There's less activity, but doesn't mean that there is no activities. In fact, you can participate and engage in cultural exchange and community building with uh, different uh, friends and uh, from different countries and different parts of the world. Then we have a new concept, which is we call houses. These are safe places for co-creation, pure mentorship, and the strong focus on well-being. Today's webinar, we will concentrate on the halls of residence, residential colleges, student residences, and houses. NUS College, they will have their separate engagement session, and you can find out a lot more about NUS College in the NUS College engagement section. Now, for some students who say, I'm very interested to stay on campus. I want to enrich my NUS experience. I want to actually get to meet friends from different parts of the world and from different faculties. However, cost is a problem. Now, don't worry about cost because if you are financially needy students, not to worry, we have a large number of bursaries and supports that will enable you to actually stay on campus as well. So what are the kind of uh, bursaries and grants that may actually support you for an on-campus stay? For example, we have what we call residential program bursary. If you stay in the house of residence, you can apply for the residential program bursary and you can also apply for this when you stay in the houses and for certain students with certain role in the student residences. You can apply for the residential program bursary. For the, this is uh, actually with a quantum of $500 to $4,020 per year for Singapore citizens depending on the assessed financial need of this applicant. Now, there's another type that is residential college bursary. Now, that one, this you actually apply, uh, this is a bursary with quantum 
for up to $5,000 per year. Now, this again depends on the assessed financial need and the nationality of the applicant. These are for students who are staying in the residential colleges. NUS College is also considered as one of the residential colleges. So for residential college bursary, this is open to all Singapore citizens, as well as PR and international students. Now, if you take up one of these uh, bursary, either residential program bursary or residential college bursary, you will cover quite a significant portion of the cost for on-campus stay. However, there is still a balance. For students who are actually, uh, that the per capita income is actually not more than $750, we do understand that this may be a challenge as well, in the sense that the shortfall, you still have to actually pay for that. So in fact, there is an additional enhancement, which is we call the Opportunity Enhancement Grant. That we started last year, and we are continuing it all the way. That is for students, Singapore citizens, with per capita income up to $750, <clears throat> you will get this Opportunity Enhancement Grant of $10,000 over a period of four years. What happens here is that, let's say you decide to stay in the first year on campus. You take up the residential program bursary. There is a shortfall in terms of the cost. You can use your Opportunity Enhancement Grant to pay for the shortfall. And that is the amount of $10,000 spread over four years. How you use it, that is up to you. And this is for you to support you for on-campus stay and overseas programs. Different halls, different residential colleges, they have their own bursaries and grants. You can also apply for that, this as well <clears throat> to support your stay. So essentially, the first type, the second type, and the third type, you can apply to the Office of Admission which I have, uh, which is uh, my office, and you can the QR code there, and then and, and then for the resident uh, for the horse bursary or the uh, college grants, you apply directly to that specific college uh, and the specific horse. So I will leave the slide here for a moment <clears throat> before I stop share because, like I said, the main star of today's this evening's webinar is my colleagues for the Office of Student Affairs, as well as the student representative that you are going to meet. So I pass my time now to my good friend, Professor Hoan Kitts, and it's always a great pleasure to share the, share the stage together with Prof. Ho. So Prof. Ho, please. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Go, uh, and and also for the very very kind introduction. Indeed, uh, Prof Go is exactly right uh, that uh, we we are good friends and we love sharing the stage together. And I must say that Prof Go, in fact, I will count him as one of uh, uh, my mentor uh, in the university, as he has paved the way for for me to uh, develop my teaching and also other abilities as and as well as opportunities to contribute back to the university. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here to tell you a little bit more about residential life and also student life at large. You know, uh, as the Dean of Student, I often been asked the question, what do I do and what is my main role? Well, I count myself as having a very enviable job, being at the forefront of student life for the whole university. In fact, the way I will answer those questions, what I do, is that my role is one whereby everything outside of the classroom is my business. So what does that include? Well, together with the whole Office of Student Affairs, which are comprised of about 100 uh, full-time staff, we run programs and we oversee student life activities uh, in the areas of residential living, in terms of co-curricular activities, sports, the arts and culture, creating opportunities for community engagements, uh, looking after student wellness, as well as providing for student accessibility and special needs. So sometimes I count this role as rather unusual for an academic like myself as well as Prof Go. Because at the same time, I am still teaching uh, uh, in the Department of Pharmacy in the area of pharmaceutical science, uh, and I also run my own research program in toxicology. 
But a series of past experiences at the university have led me to what I'm doing now. And most mo notably of which are the ones that I'm showing you in the picture, as you can see in the slides. So for seven years of my life, I actually stayed on campus together with the students in one of the halls of residence, Raffles Hall. So as a live-in resident fellow, my job was to interact and to mentor students uh, beyond the classroom and more often than not, beyond office hours. And through those interactions, we wrestle over different ideas for different types of hall productions. We cheer them on when they participate in sports competition. We resolve uh, interpersonal conflicts that may arise from time to time. And we taught them how to cope with their own failures. And the picture here on the top left was how, uh, together with a group of uh, very enthusiastic students, we learned how to produce original musical and to actually conduct an academic course to teach them to the mechanics of organizing and staging a musical so that it is not just an exercise that they do for fun, but actually they pick up very valuable skill set that they can take with you even after uh, co completing the production and graduated from the university. Moving on from that, the bottom left picture show how alumni whom I have worked with before in the hostel, they came back year after year to view the performances of those put up by the juniors years after they have graduated. They left behind memories, but more importantly, legacy that they see living on in the lives of those who come after them. You know, all these experiences actually helped me see that even as an academic, I can add value to student life and in a very different capacity as what I can do in the classroom. In fact, I would say that this type of uh, engagement may be even more meaningful and important if you consider the type of skills that our students need to acquire in order to survive in a, in a more uncertain and disruptive future than the one that we now know. So with that experience and enjoying that, uh, when the chance came for me to join the Office of Student Affairs, very promptly I said yes, and then the rest was history, and here I am. So more closer to where we are at right now, the picture on the right show my engagement with other student leaders in my capacity as a, as a dean of student. So on the top right was leadership seminar where we advocate key leadership values for the new cohort of student leaders across the university. And the bottom was a key uh, tea session uh, before a subsequent dialogue session where the student union leaders, they shared the stage with the senior management of the university so that they can have a dialogue and discussion about the state of affairs for students and how they can forge a way forward together. Now, you may wonder, why do I have to start with this? Uh, well, it's because I think from these past experiences, I come to realize that student life beyond the classroom is not just good, but actually it is necessary. It is necessary for the holistic development of our students because all these additional things that were, they were picked up from social experiences are going to amount to quite a bit of life skills that they will need in the future. And all these experiences out of the classroom also constitute what I call the soul of the university. Why soul of the university? Well, because, you know, with the pandemic, we can see that actually we don't really need a physical university. Everything that we do can be turned online. So what only remains that cannot be turned online, I would say, is student life. And these are things that can only be done when you engage with one another face to face and to wrestle through all the different problems together. And it is through all this face to face interaction that you find a deeper meaning in a university life and pick up values that will be meaningful for many years to come. And that is why, without this student life, the university has no soul. Now, from, so it is from social experiences and the uh, and and that students learn about um, various things in the, in the hostel community. Uh, this is where 
they learn how to live with one another, how to work through issues, uh, how to have a global, develop a mindset of global citizenship, which is so critical to us, a small nation like Singapore. You know, through also participating in sports, uh, students develop individual traits of agility, of resilience, of strength, and also of teamwork. When they participate in arts and culture, they appreciate beauty, precision, and also gain creativity. And through all these, students find their balance in life and they sustain, and in that process, they sustain their physical as well as mental well-being. And therefore, while student life does not confer you a degree, it is integral to education. So in NUS, we see this as important and therefore we create opportunities for students to be engaged in them. So what do we have on offer you know, for any given students over the next four years, you are going to uh, see opportunities across more than 200 CCA groups, more than 60 sports groups that you can uh, participate in both recreationally as well as competitively, as well as more than 30 arts and cultures groups. And there are also many more that I cannot cover on this slide, but you can get more information by, by clicking on the a QR code as attached or on this screen over here. But in the heart of student life activities, tonight we are actually focusing on residential life. In NUS, we have more than 11,000 students who stay on campus. And for us, we see a special place for hostel in terms of student life. It is not just simply providing a roof over the head uh, for students, but we see residential life also as an opportunity to maximize student learning and their experiences. Well, just think about it. For students staying on campus, effectively, they may be spending more time in the hostels than in the classroom, more of their wake, waking hours are spent together in that community that live and, and do activities together. Therefore, this is a tremendous amount of time as well as opportunity. And if we do not do more to add value to that opportunity, I think we are just letting this whole opportunity go to waste. And which is why we would like to see residential life as an area where we can do more than just providing a roof over the head. So uh, these activities uh, can allow them, uh, students as they work together to build social capital and life skills, learning how to live with one another and solve problems together. And this certainly is an important extension to the whole idea of holistic learning. Now, what exactly are the different residential life model that we have created. Now, we believe that no two individuals are exactly the same. And for that reason, we also should not create a cookie cutter style residential life uh, whereby every hostel is built exactly the same way. Uh, in fact, we, need, we see the need for variation so that each student can pick and choose a hostel type that uh, resonate the best with your own preferred style of living. Uh, in short, we have four housing model types in NUS. So uh, Prof Go has briefly mentioned the halls of residence, the residential colleges, the residences, as well as houses. Uh, we have put together a video last year in order to introduce the four uh, different types and to, to illustrate the distinctives of each of them. Uh, we will not play that video here, but likewise, you can access that video using the QR code as shown on this screen, and you can do that after this. But for now, before I transition the time over to our students to tell you more about each of these host for housing type, let me just say each of them, describe each of them in a few words. Halls of residences, we have six. And each of the hall of residence uh, hold about uh, six, uh, four to six hundred uh, students, depending on the size of that hostel. Now, the whole idea of house of residence is to create a very vibrant and intense environment where students can participate in a whole range of CCA, and most of which 
are conceptualized and run by the students themselves. So this, uh, together with meal plan, give the students an extensive time to live together, to work together, and to also enjoy uh, their experiences through running the different CCA group. And it is through such activities that they also build their own culture as well as a leader, a student leadership uh, a capacity, which will give them the, the, the network as well as the, as the skills to also take that into their future uh, workforce. On the right-hand side, we have uh, residential colleges and currently we have four of them, the College of Ellis and Peter Tan, uh, the Richview Residences, uh, Residential College 4, as well as Tembusu. Now, the distinctive here is that in addition to leaving, they also participate in residential academic programs. And the four residential college each has a, a, a specific theme and they run modules and uh, courses that resonate around that theme. And the idea is that when you have uh, students who come from different academic disciplines, living and learning about a new subject to, together, they bring their own experiences to the table and enrich that discussion as well as the things that they can take away. So that is the richness of such an environment. Uh, we have two uh, student residences, uh, the Prince uh, George's Park residences, as well as the Utah residences. Originally, these were positioned really as no frills accommodation, where we may have students who would prefer not to be uh, burdened with too many uh, co-curricular activities beyond those that they are already participating back in their home faculty. So such accommodation will fit them very well. But in recent years, we recognize that even for students staying in this kind of no frills accommodation, they will still benefit from having closer pastoral care and mentoring. And with a recent uh, hostel transformation, we actually added uh, hostel masters as well as resident fellow to support and provide the safety net and the local governance uh, for all the student residences, uh, the students who stay in such residences. So today, it is actually a little bit more enriched than, than simply a no-frills accommodation. And finally, what we have added to the diversity are houses. Now, houses is a little bit similar to the halls of residence, but the demands on co-curricular activities may not be as high. And the other feature is that there is no uh, compulsory meal plan. And actually, this is useful in a sense whereby some of the students can have more flexibility to choose the different uh, types of meals that they can enjoy on, uh, on campus, different parts of the campus, and also facilitate them to use the meal time to get together in smaller group uh, for bonding as well as to organize some other small-scale ground-up activities. So across all these four types of housing options, we hope we have given uh, students sufficient choice such that each person can find something that they can align well with and thrive in that environment. So I am going to leave that uh, uh, here because I think it's more importantly, it will be good for you to hear from the students themselves as they share their own journey with you. So thank you for being a very patient and good audience. I uh, look forward to engage you further in the dialogue and Q&A session later. Thanks. Eunice, back to you. Thank you, Prof Go and Prof Ho for your sharing. We will now move on to the Q&A segment, and we have especially invited four students, Yifan, Nathi, Sushan, and Minghui to share with us today. Yifan is a final year student at the College of Design and Engineering, pursuing electrical engineering. He became a resident assistant at Prince George's Park Residence in 2022, and enjoys sharing his experience with freshmen, especially international students, enable them to assimilate and enjoy a great NUS experience while away from home. Concurrently, he is the pioneer batch of P2P Residential Committee, the P2PRC, which organizes social activities for P2PR residents, and he is also the inaugural elected president of P2PRC. Natalie is a third-year student at the College of Humanities and Sciences, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, majoring in Geography and minoring in Communications and New Media. A resident at Richview Residential College, RBRC, Natalie served as the Freshman Orientation Program Project Director in 2021 
and has held a number of positions such as a peer mentor and social media creative in her three years with the college. Outside of RBRC, Natalie was also part of the pioneering batch of student entrepreneurs recruited by NUS Co-op in 2022, selling handmade jewelry. She is currently spending a semester in England under the Student Exchange Program, SCP, at the Lovera University. Sushan is a third year student pursuing a double degree in Law and Economics at the Faculty of Law and College of Humanities and Sciences, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. He enjoys a wide breadth of outdoor activities ranging from diving to hiking and the occasional game of frisbee or basketball. As a resident assistant at Lighthouse, he has also contributed to a range of initiatives such as his inaugural orientation last year, mural paintings, and most recently an upcoming school trip to Bali as part of a proactive pastoral care team. Ming Clay is a second year student at the College of Humanities and Sciences Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, majoring in economics. She is currently residing at Temasek Hall and has a deep passion for dance, especially contemporary and open genres, and actively contributes to the dance scene at Temasek Hall Dance Club. Mingwei also holds several leadership positions at Temasek Hall, where she is the marketing head, batch co project director, and the receive and give rec vice project director. Most recently, she has been appointed as the external relations director for the upcoming academic year as part of the Tomasic Hall Junior Common Room Committee, ACRC. I'll hand the time over to Prof Go, who will be moderating the QA segment with Prof Ho, Sui Fan, Natalie, Sushan, and Ming Hui. Prof Go, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eunice. And thank you. So a big thank you to the four students who are joining uh, Prof Ho and I today. And I think the, the sharing that you're going to give to our prospective students will be really valuable. Now, um, um, maybe because there were so many of you and uh, and uh, we just went through what you have done uh, very quickly. So maybe I'll just first start off by inviting each of you to say a few words to the students. And uh, maybe I will just follow the order that you were introduced. So I'll start with uh, Yufan, then Natalie, Sushan, and Minghui. So uh, Yufan, would you like to start first to just say a few words to the audience and introduce yourself? Hi, hello everyone. Can, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Hello. Okay, hello. thank you, Prof Go. Uh, so I'll briefly introduce myself. My name is Yu Fan. I'm, uh, I'm be a final year student in electrical engineering in the next academic year. So I've been living in PGPR since my day one in PGPR. So, uh, so as for my knowledge for other type of Residences, I might not be so familiar with this, but for any uh, any questions regarding PGPR or rather student residences, I'll be more than glad to share my experience to you and to help you choose the uh, type of residences or type of the student dorm that you desire the most. Because uh, according uh, along all the different types of uh, student residences or the other halls or horses. Uh, you can't say that which one is the best, but uh, the only one you can say is suit you the most. So I hope that today's session will help you to choose the one you desire the most. I thank you so much. Thank you, Ifan. That's very thoughtful of you. Uh, over to you, Natalie. Hi, everybody. I'm Natalie. I'm a third year geography undergraduate, and I've been with RBRC for the past three years. So essentially, my entire undergraduate journey so far. And currently, I'm doing a semester abroad, like also known as the exchange program. I'm at Loughborough University in England. Yeah, so it's all quite exciting. And I'm really excited to share about my experience in NUS with you guys. And I really understand how confusing and lost you might feel right now with so many options. So we're all here to help. And just feel free to ask us anything. Yeah. Thank you, Natalie. Sushan, please go ahead. Everyone. Uh, my name is Sushant. I'm a year three law and economics double degree student. Um, I spent my first two years in school staying in Tembusu College in an RC. And now in my third year, I'm a resident assistant at Lighthouse. So as a newest kid on the block, I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of questions to ask. Um, just hear straight from the house about what a house, what a house might be and uh, how houses might be different from other house, hostel types in NUS. And I'm very glad to be here to share with all of you and help you guys make an informed choice about um, the kind of residential options you might you want to pursue. Thank you. And uh, over to you, Minghui. 
Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Meng. Uh, I've been staying in Tomasic Hall for the past two years, and I'll be staying in Tomasic Hall for the next year as well. Um, I'm currently in year two and studying economics. Yeah. So feel free to ask any questions regarding um, halls of residences. Yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. Okay. Now, I, I, I think I've, uh, okay, this, this is really a very exciting group of uh, participants in the webinar. I've seen so many questions posted in the past 30 minutes and I was busy reading through all the questions. And I think the first thing that comes to the mind of many of you is that there are so many different types of accommodation. While we have explained, uh, Prof. and I try our best to explain to you, but I think nothing beats uh, hearing from the students who have been there, who have done that. And uh, let, let's go back to the rewind a little bit. Let's go back to the oldest type first, horse of residence. Now, what's so special about horse of residence? And in particular, I noticed that Meng, Meng Hui has actually stayed there for two years and going to stay for a third year. So there must be something so attractive about staying in Tamasic Hall. Uh, maybe you can uh, tell us about uh, what's so special about Tamasic Hall. About Tumasic Hall, um, I think essentially it's like the vibrant culture that we have in mm. our halls. So mm. we have a lot of different CCAs um, that anyone can join really. It's, it's an environment for safe learning, safe um, a really safe space to explore different things. So a lot of sports, a lot of cultural and a lot of committees where you can really uh, make friends and yeah and enjoy your time doing all these activities <laughs> yeah so so how, how does it compare with other horse of residence how many are there all together i understand there are six yeah. right yeah the, the horse of residence so maybe you can uh okay uh, no worries uh mm -hmm. prof ho will help you to explain the rest mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> maybe you can explain a couple that you are familiar with and prof ho will, 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 will answer the rest of it uh, explain the rest to the others sure so um there are currently six halls of residence and each hall has a different culture and also they are known for different different things so generally, Tamasic Hall and Yusuf Hall are known as your sports hall. So that's where um, you will excel in sports. And recently, Tamasic Hall just won the Inter Hall Games as well for this year. So that's why that's why the two sports uh the two sports halls are called sports halls. <laughs> yeah, and then <laughs> we, we have um Raffles, Penridge, and Shears Hall. They are known for more cultural CCA, so that's where they excel. And then we have KE7. Um, they are known to be a more chill hall. Yeah, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> what, 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 what is chill hall, by the way? <laughs> Can uh, you... <laughs> I think not as intense or not as competitive I as see, the rest of the halls. So, yeah. for example, maybe for TH. In uh -huh. specifically, we are very intense in our sports trainings because um uh -huh. we want to win. Yeah. But uh I think for maybe KE7, they're not as intense. They take it more as a recreational kind of training and not so much like uh wah, intense, intense. Yeah. I see. Intense. I see. Okay, I, I think maybe a uh, proper you want to add on a little bit more? Sure. Yeah. I, well, well, I think Meng is is correct. Uh, on on is certainly correct in describing her very own hall, uh, Marseille Hall. But I would say that uh, maybe let's talk about why there are differences. Um, I think halls having very uh, have a, having longer history than the other types of housing allows certain heritage to be carried through from one generation to another generation. So, uh, and also due to their location, over time, they may draw certain students that may come from the more proximal uh, faculties. For example, uh, in, in King Edward Seven Hall, because of where it is right now, it tends to draw a lot of students from the science, medicine, and other health sciences faculty. So with time, they may also develop a subculture with that kind of uh, uh, 
students uh, sharing lives and doing activities together. And as a result, they, they will tend to, uh, more, more of such students may also tend to join them. Uh, then uh, in Raffles Hall is right in the center of the university. The epi our account as an epicenter. So, so that central location actually is close enough to most other faculty. So you also you see quite a good balance of students across the university. And uh, then the other halls uh, that's uh, on the other end of the campus, you will have more of the uh, arts and social science students, business students, and computer science students. So sometimes geography does make a difference. And with time, the uh, same group of people come together will create a certain identity. Uh, I think the identity is also a good thing because that identity uh, will continue to um, help alumni who look back or come back to visit to feel that they are, they are still part of that community and give them a stronger reason to want to contribute there. So at our end, we are not trying to change any of their culture. Uh, we will just hope that, you know, certain um, um, unhealthy part of culture, like for example, how there may be inter-hall rivalries that may arise over the years. Well, we will try to play down on some of those unhealthy competition, but to bring out the other values that make them who they are. I, I think I think uh, Prof. Ho has a very good point. Essentially, we let our whole horse, our culture, the culture in the horse grow organically. I, I think, uh, and to a certain extent, probably geography plays a role too, because certain horse, uh, like for example, I remember that uh, Cheers Hall was near the Faculty of Science before it moved yes. to the other side. And probably the, the number uh, of students, uh, the student composition may have changed too, I guess. Mm. But but interestingly, uh, Natalie is a geography major, and uh, and you are staying in RERC. So how does geography plays a role in your choice of staying in RERC, Natalie? I would say geography for me personally did play like a role, both like literally and metaphorically, because as a geography major, uh, RERC is known for its like sustainability program. Ah. As well. But if we are also talking about like physical geography, RERC is the only residential college outside of U-Town. So I think that actually is quite interesting and it does change the entire like experience of living in a college as well. Yeah. I see, I see, because you are interested in the sustainability program of RERC being a geography major. Now, so, so that, that actually brings a, another anger that sometimes like in the residential colleges, they are academic program and each of these have their own focus and uh, RVRC is into sustainability and that's why you 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 uh, you chose it there and uh, you actually took some of the can you share with the audience what kind of sustainability related classes that you have taken that can be counted towards your general education requirement okay so RVRC actually recently revamped their education um, system. So for my batch, because I'm in the third year, I was part of the old curriculum where the three modules that I took are now currently not run. But for the incoming batches, there are four different modules that you have to take, which will map to your general education pillar. So these modules include like um, the Singapore studies and engaging communities and sustainabilities. So while there are some differences from the ones that I took and the ones that um, you guys will be taking, one of the projects I did was on like how to um, recycle polymailers and all these are very, very um, real topics that you really have the experience to go hands on within the residential college. Yeah. And just to link to Suryon's question, I saw your question in the Q&A, um, the differences between the different residential colleges. Um, each residential college does have its own unique uh, theme. So for example, like PEPT has its um, main focus on community engagement, while RC4 is focused on systems thinking. Uh, Tembusu is known for being um, more into like inquiry and political thinking, political thought, while RVRC is for sustainability. So the modules for each college are different and they do um, align towards like the college's mission. So for example, um, if you do want to focus on like communities, community engagement, um, CAT would do it from a more social angle, but RVRC mm -hmm. would do it from a sustainability perspective. So that's how the colleges do differ. 
Mm. I see. Uh, that that is very illuminating. And uh, talking about Tembusu, I think uh, Sushan has actually stayed in Tembusu as well. So maybe you can comment about how is it like staying in the university town? Because the residential colleges, apart from RBRC, the rest are all inside university town. And the university town, you know, we, every time, when, okay, the, the uh, office of admission, is in the university town. Every time I look at the, the, the green field outside, it's so wonderful. In the evening, I saw students playing frisbee. So maybe, uh, uh, Sushan, you can tell us a little bit more about staying in Tembusu uh, College. Um, so yeah, certainly. I think the T uh, Tembusu College and the other RCs that are located on uh, university town actually benefit from being in a very beautiful and well-endowed campus with a lot of facilities like our green field, uh, the study rooms in the ERC, as well as like the two MBSH in, um, sorry, the UTSH, sorry, uh, in the camp on Newtown itself. So these sports halls, um, the gym, the field, and the study rooms all actually help uh, residents, students in RCs actually um, venture out beyond their residential colleges and also engage with students outside and from other RCs in university town itself. So back in Tembusu, um, I think you rightly pointed out that you always see a bunch of students playing on the field, especially frisbee. Frisbee, so, yes, yes. Yeah, Tembusu was actually known for having pioneered that because um, uh -huh. we were one of the first residential colleges and we had uh, the Barefoots interest group that basically plays barefooted on the green field uh, and we play frisbee quite regularly then. Uh -huh. So that was, uh, that was actually a really fun experience because uh, we also play with other residential colleges and we get to experience and learn from other residential colleges and also see how we can uh, collaborate on various initiatives within the university town itself. Yeah. I see. And, and that now, now that you have moved to uh, one of the houses, Lighthouse in particular, so, so would you like to compare and contrast uh, the difference between staying in the residential college and staying in one of the houses, and in particular, Lighthouse? Right, so um, I think I can speak for residential, residential colleges as being very academically focused because there is a strong intellectual inquiry that is required in the different modules you engage with and also when you bring your interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary thinking to these modules. Um, in Lighthouse, we do not have such an academic program. In fact, I believe all the houses do not have an academic program. Instead, uh, houses are more student initiative oriented because we value um, student run and student led initiatives from the very ground up. And so this gives us a, a wide breadth of um, possible activities that can be planned. So for example, in Lighthouse itself as a resident assistant, I've overseen a number of um, block events, which are basically like uh, events across our entire Lighthouse residence group. So we have got uh, mural paintings, we've had interblock games, and we've had a whole bunch of uh, other fireside chats with various illuminaries who come over and help and help um, and to speak to us on different activities, basically. Yeah. So, so which one would you recommend? Uh, staying in the houses or staying in the Tempuzo, or am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> um, I think if you're intellectually minded and you value the intellectual curiosity, uh, RC definitely offers uh, the opportunity to like explore that curiosity which you may not have to find in a house because um, in a house, you don't have such an opportunity just by design. Instead, if you value the, the, the opportunity to create your own initiatives, and these mm -hmm. initiatives can also be uh, academically inclined or otherwise, such as sporting events or cultural events, you can also definitely initiate such events. In fact, the housing model encourages you to do so because we are focused on um, allowing students to come up with their own initiatives with a group of friends, and just plan an event uh, and just head out yeah and have fun i see i see so 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 the, the so i i guess the the whole idea about having the houses is uh, to provide opportunity for students to have their own initiative as well but this concept of houses i understand that it, it was only started uh, last year and uh, i guess uh, propo is one of the people who actually helped to uh, make this happen and uh, from I, I saw the number of houses actually increase from one to two and then now to three so i i guess there's something there that uh, is popular is gaining traction so i, I will invite prof ho to explain a little bit more about the overarching 
ideas about having houses as the fourth type of on-campus accommodation? Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Prof. Go. Actually, the the uh, the whole transformation started even more than a year ago. In more fact, uh-huh. the very first house conceptually was developed in 2017. Wow. And, but at, I see. at that time, we didn't call it its current name, the Pioneer House. We just call uh-huh. it PGP House. Yes. And, and it was started as an experiment to see if this new uh, model of housing would work and whether there will be that, that it will achieve the intended goal to liberate students without a meal plan to use that time and the opportunity and the space to do small group ground up activities. And indeed, that experiment paid off where we saw how the PGP house have developed their very own peer mentoring program. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the peer mentoring program was so successful that we recognized that this is something worth uh, replicating uh, in, in other places. So with the success of the PGP house, we've decided then back then in uh, late 2020 that perhaps we can convert some of the other uh, residences into more houses. And that was where last year, uh, Lighthouse came on board and in, for this round of intake, we have the very new uh, new kid on the block, the Helix House, that will also uh, start their activities uh, and recruitment. So, uh, so therefore, the, the proliferation of the houses model is really a testament to the success of what has happened to PGP House uh, over the last four or five years. And we hope that uh, it won't that the other two houses that are now coming up, they will also create other kinds of ground out activities mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. and the incoming uh, residences will play a very big part in shaping that. Sure, sure. So, so as you can see here in NUS, not only we innovate on our curriculum, even for residential life, we actually innovate different models as well to facilitate the growth of students. Now, the fourth type, which is uh, PGPR, which is the student residences. And uh, Yufan, he's a resident assistant inside the, uh, in the PGPR. And um, uh, maybe uh, Yufan, can you share with us uh, what, how is it like inside a student residences? Now, I understand that there's no meal plan and probably less activities, but nevertheless, there's still a large community of uh, uh, different nationality of students and uh, what are the things that you do as the resident assistant? Uh, sure. So, uh, so uh, as I previously introduced, I am from PGPR. It stands for Prince George's Park Residences. Uh, so PGPR is known as a MTV, uh, independent lifestyle, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that it has the, because some people have some misunderstanding that PGPR, P- residents in PGPR, they do not need to engage with others. They just stay in their room, uh, proceed with a study, and finish one year of exam. That's it. This is totally incorrect about uh, PGPR's lifestyle. Uh, yes, we do not have any meal plan. So you rather, it's rather you can cook yourself. We have a fully function uh, kitchen. Each individual kitchen, we have two induction cookers. We have two ovens, we have one uh, microwave, and so the full set of kitchen will allow you to cook any meal you want. So actually answering Yuki's question in the Q&A, so if you want to cook often, uh, PJPR is actually a uh, very, very best, uh, is a very good choice for you. Uh, as for the events, uh, we do not have much compulsory events uh, compared to houses and other acti- other types of uh, residences because uh, PGPR, uh, we have a very large portion of uh, postgraduate student in PGPR. So to, we want to actually emphasize on this individual and the independence lifestyle. However, as a resident assistant, actually very big part of our job is to organize all the enrichment events and the mega events. So in every single semester, we have Three different, uh, three different RE teams. The first one is R1 team, R2 GSA team, and third is R3 team. Each uh, uh, RE team need to come out and organize two enrichment program, which is relatively uh, like, uh, small in scale. 
usually 50 to 60 packs, and it's open to all PGPR residences. And each uh, RA team need to come up with one mega event. So one mega event means this event is going to catering for more than 200 uh, participants. So we have some example, like uh, the most recent is uh, Songkran, uh, PGPR Songkran event is the uh, water water festival in Thai Thailand. Oh, so I see. in this in this in this activity, we just book the entire uh, basketball court. Then we hand over everyone a squirt gun, so for you fill with water and just shoot to each other, and the chase. And also we have other. Uh, very fun uh, water activities going on and games. You can win some. You can win some prizes. Uh, and this is so. This is the Sunkran uh Sunkran festival activity. And before the final exam, we always have these uh events called the reignite. So basically, we are going to hire some DJ come come to uh to PGPR and you can have some a nice snack. You have uh, grab some drink. And just dance with your friends that dance the stress away before the final grand final exams. Uh, and plus all the uh enrichment program, actually the amount of events in every semester is really, really a lot. And if you want to participate, uh if you want to occasionally participate in some events, you'll find it that the life in PG Paris is really colorful and wonderful. And uh you, I'm sure that you can make the most of your time efficient in PGPR. So our uh, motto for PGPR and uh, our key value for PGPR is unity from diversity, because PGPR has catered for, uh, for students that are from over sixty nationalities, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of uh, international students there. So if you want to engage with people from all over the world, uh, uh you can. Uh, PGPR is definitely a very good choice for you as well. Yes. So to sum up, uh, PGPR do encourage uh, for those who want to live independently in the US or uh, PGPR, we do not have any mand mandatory meal plan, plan. We do not have any compulsory CCA events. So if you want to stay, uh, if you want a very nice uh, alone study time, PGPR can just be a place that you you just to stay there and sleep at night and study. But if you want to have a really colorful life, PPR also provides you catering with you very vast variety of events. Mm -hmm. uh, any events that you can even think of, you can even suggest to the RE team like what event you want next semester. And we'll try to make it happen if it's really nice and we really appreciate this idea. So uh, for PJPR, I really, really appreciate it uh, because uh, it, provides us a very vast variety of events and the very different lifestyles of people actually can just enjoy the life in PGPR. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Yifan. I think this really actually uh, explained that uh, PGPR is not just like a hostel, a place to stay. There are activities, you make friends, more than 60 different nationalities. I think this is something that uh, you actually get to experience uh, in, in this. So I think uh, now, now that I've explained all this and all the students have explained all this, I think all of us actually have a better idea in the different types of uh, uh, on-campus accommodations. Now, uh, a typical question one would ask is that, do I get a chance to see how the rooms lie, how the halls lie? Now, uh, okay, let me do one advertisement first. If you go to the Office of Admission website, you can actually find a uh, 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 360 virtual tour and you can actually get to see some of the rooms uh, inside the halls as well and the different parts of the campus as well. So that is one thing you can do. But of course, uh, mine is a poor solution. Prof Ho will have a much better solution about showing students how the halls looks like. So I'll let Prof Ho explain to you whether they have a chance to get to see all these halls and, and, and accommodations. Yes, yes, definitely. And in fact, uh, you know, you, you can go to the website to see pictures uh, and as pictures speaks a thousand words, right? But a thousand pictures cannot show you what the real experience is like. So therefore, to, to recreate the real experience, I think individual hostel, they do conduct their own open house events. Uh, for example, 
most of the halls of residences, they are going to hold what they call a, a hall experience camp sometime in the first few days of next month. And, and they will do their own pub publicity. So do keep a lookout when those events are, are taking place so that you can not only go on site to look at the facility yourselves, but more importantly, to experience the kind of core culture that you have heard them talk about and see it for yourself, experience it for yourself if it's something that is really for you. Uh, likewise, I believe all other uh, hostels will have some form of uh, or, or, um, a welcome events or open house, may not be all held at the same time, uh, and, and they may put that information on their own website uh, rather than the common one that is through the Office of Admissions. So if you have a specific hostel in mind, I would mm -hmm. suggest that you go to that specific website to gain such information. Yes, absolutely. The, 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 uh, I, I actually went to the website. I saw some of the halls also have their own uh, 3D, uh, 360 virtual tour and you get to see a lot more information. Do visit that as well. And, uh, and now, now that we are all very interested in this and how to apply, I've seen many, many questions that you have posted about, uh, about uh, how to uh, apply. And I think my colleagues uh, have already given you the link and the dates of application. But there's a question that, that is uh, in the lingering doubt that uh, you know is very attractive to stay on campus. But uh, so the question is that, is it possible to stay all four years on campus? Now, uh, just now, Prof. Holes uh, actually uh, did an estimate. Uh, there were 11,000 students staying on campus. As a mathematician, let me do the math for you. Every year, we take in 7,000 undergraduate students. Four years, there's 28,000 students, but only 11,000 students stay on campus all the time. So, so I, I guess uh, uh, maybe I'll let Prof. explain a little bit more about uh, whether uh, how one can actually have an opportunity to at least to experience this. Now, how to stay longer? And uh, that, again, come to the point about uh, uh, the, the so-called, that you may have heard from your seniors, the so-called points system that I'll let some of our students here who managed to stay three mm. years on campus, you know, uh, Meng Hui, uh, Natalie, you know, about uh, how they navigate this. So I'll let Prof. Ben uh, explain a little bit more for us, and then I'll let the two uh, students explain about how they managed to get to stay longer on campus. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, the reality is that the number speaks for itself. Uh, so there isn't enough housing for everybody. Uh, but, but at the same time, not every single person wants to stay on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will say that for a freshman, uh, a significant percentage of people who apply will get a place to stay at least for uh, one, one year. But there, but but there's no guarantee, and, and, and as I said, uh, the number speaks for itself. There will be some who apply and may not get it. But for those who don't get it in their first year, don't feel totally discouraged because you can always try again in the subsequent semester or, or year. And there are other ways you can do to help yourself win a better, better chance of, of securing a space. For example, for the senior students, there are students who can secure their housing uh, through other schemes, uh, such as their uh, active participation within their CCA groups. So that will be another avenue where you can get a place to stay. And also other people can stay uh, when they are participating in specialized programs that come along with, uh, with uh, on-campus accommodation. Uh, such as the entrepreneurship program. So uh, there are other opportunities, but even you add all that together, it's not 100%. Uh, as a university, we do try to maximize that. Uh, uh, to, to, so, so therefore, for freshmen and for people who never get a chance to stay, we, we will try to take a closer look at the patient and we will try our best uh, to help. Yeah. And yeah. if really cannot, then... Uh, we hope that you can also, you know, experience campus life through exchange programs and things like that. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I echo completely what Prof. Ho said. And uh, if you look at our 
financial aid scheme that you know our we have an aspiration when we came up with the enhanced financial aid scheme that I think some of you may have heard me speaking about, we want to make sure that all NUS students at least have one year of on-campus stay so that they have such an experience because the experience is really can be very different. And of course, uh, if you can't have it on campus in NUS during exchange, that is another opportunity for you to, to see it. And uh, may, maybe let me uh, pass the time to Natalie and uh, Meng Hui to talk a little bit about the point system, you know. Uh, so Natalie, would you like to start first? Okay, or, sure. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, so actually for the residential colleges, um, what sets it apart from halls is that there isn't a point system. It is ah. that you're actually guaranteed a two-year stay. So you do have to apply in your first year. And one of these reasons is because you have to complete your academic modules. So you take the different modules across your first two years um, of living on campus. And actually, there are opportunities to stay in your third and fourth year. So speaking for RRC, you could apply to become a residential assistant, a teaching assistant mm -hmm. for one of the um, year one and two modules, um, a senior peer mentor. And there are just so many opportunities, honestly. And it's really possible to stay in your third and fourth year. But definitely, that would mean that in your first two years, you would have had to contribute back to the college in uh, various ways in terms of like leadership positions or interest groups. Yeah, because it is competitive to be to get a position to stay on in your later years. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. I see. And uh, I, I guess uh, to be a teaching assistant, so I guess this is under the uh, NUS uh, uh, study work scheme. Am I right to say that? And that's yes, the NUS yes. student work scheme. So personally, I actually um, mm. did work for RVRC in the past three years, like over the right. past three years as like a social media creative. So the, uh -huh. it isn't just academic roles as well. Yeah. So, so it, uh, okay. So I, I think maybe I take this opportunity to see how to mention a little bit more about how you can enrich your NUS life. We have this, what we call NSWS scheme, NUS uh, study work scheme that enables you to do some job on campus, learn something like, like what uh, Natalie has done, need not be uh, academic, but it could be something like social media creator. Yeah? So that, that, that is something that is possible, right, uh, Natalie? Yes, definitely. Uh -huh. and, uh, and maybe Meng Hui can tell us more about the CCA points because I'm sure many of the audience have heard seniors talking about the, the, the CCA points. So uh, Meng Hui, would you like to explain a little bit more? Yeah, so um, for halls, unlike the RCs, there's no guaranteed two-year stay. So once you apply and you accept, you can only stay for that year. And to be guaranteed a uh, stay for the coming years, you actually have to um, go through the point system, which is meant to contribute your, uh, which is meant to capture the contributions that you have made towards the hall. So, but before I go into detail, I'd like to say that um, there's actually no minimum requirement for the CCAs that you join in halls. It's actually all up to you and what you want to make of your hall experience. So there are people with no CCAs and that's because they don't want to stay the coming years. But if you do want to stay, um, it, like everybody says, it is actually quite competitive because there are many people who want to stay. But I think instead of thinking like, um, oh, I need to join this, I need to join that to be able to stay, I think the mindset should be more of, um, I want to be involved and contribute mm -hmm. back and grow as an individual through joining all these different types of CCAs. Yeah. And then naturally with that um, mindset, you'll want to be more involved and contribute more naturally that way. Yeah, so maybe I'll provide an example of what I did in year one to be able to stay. Um, so in year one, I actually did uh, dance. I, I did dance mm -hmm. choreography and I was also involved in like quite a few dance performances. And then for that's for cultural side. I wasn't involved in any sports actually, even though I do stay in Damasic Hall. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I'm not a sports person and for committees wise I was actually a, a marketing member 
and also a member of the block committee, which is the committee that takes care of the block affairs and takes care of the people in the block itself. So with that, actually, I was able to stay um, quite comfortably. And yeah, I, I don't think it's as competitive as people make it out to be. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really all about their mindset of being involved and contributing back. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's about it for the point system in halls. I see. That, that's wonderful. Actually, I think uh, I learned something from Meng, Meng Hui's uh, sharing. Be positive, you know, contribute in whatever way that you can. I think that is the key point here. Now, in the remaining about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, let me change topic a little bit. I think many of you said, I'm going to now enter university. Now, we all know that the transition from JC to university is, can be significant. And, uh, and you want to have a vibrant student life as well in the university. So the question is that, how do we have a good balance between, you know, social life, academic studies, you know, community living, CCAs? And uh, so how, how do we do it? You know, okay. I think that, that, that for this question, I think, uh, uh, Hanket, uh, no worries. I'm not going to ask you to answer. Uh, we are not qualified to answer. <laughs> so let, let us get some students uh, here to answer. And Susha, you, you, uh, you, you actually had a very demanding course. You have a double degree program between law and economics. You know, law by itself is a really demanding course and together with economics and you still have all these additional activities. So how do you strike a good balance between academics and uh, uh, other activities? Um, I think a, lot, a large part of stay on campus was actually to just break away from the academic rigor of my various courses and my modules in on campus. So I think um, for me, striking a balance is not really uh, um, a, a thing set in stone because it's a lot of experimentation. I find one semester to be vastly different in my mm-hmm. academic workload from the other semester. And so I find that uh, staying on campus actually allows me to take my mind off um, mm-hmm. academic stuff and also find ways to engage with uh, my other interests and pursuits that I want to like carry out. So for example, um, in Tembu, I used to play a lot of basketball and frisbee, and I think um, sporting by itself is already a, a very different uh, ball game, pardon the pun, uh, from uh, studying law or studying economics. And I think that's also a very valuable um, experience because it gives me downtime in between and lets me um, go back to my course feeling more refreshed in, like, in the daily um, grind that might, that might happen, yeah. So, so the key point, key, key takeaway, I guess, is that you need to have the correct mindset and uh, you know to to strike a good balance. Now, I you know that the NUS experience is really a journey, and uh, Yufan uh, is now in his fourth year, and uh, he's going to graduate very soon. And uh, you know, after spending four years in NUS, I'm sure you have gone through a freshman, a second year, a third year, now in the fourth year. So looking back, you know, uh, maybe you can share with the audience about how you actually transcend from one year to the other, and now you are at the point of graduation already. Uh, you find you are mute. Yes. Oh, sorry. So actually, I want to correct one thing. Mm. Uh, on the introduction page just now, right? I'm the uh-huh. final year. Uh-huh. But actually, it will, it's going to be my year three because oh, I'm, year three. I'm on I poly see. intake. Ah, I see. I so, see. Uh-huh. So, so uh, I want I don't want to confuse anyone. So I put final year there. So uh-huh. actually, I have seen some question asked in the Q and session. Say how different is the uni life compared to poly life? Uh, uh-huh. So. Uh, that would be useful. So, yeah, please. please uh, I, I yeah. believe we have a lot of uh, uh, participants here. Their life path is they finish their three years of poly study, mm-hmm. then they went into national service, then straight away come into uh, university year one study. So for me, the universe after after the two years of national uh, national service, uh, pretty much everything you learn in the school you have returned to your teacher already. So. <laughs> When you come back to uni year one, you straight away start a university level study. It's going to be tough. Uh, so for my year one, actually, uh, I have not 
done any co-curriculum activities, mainly focusing on my academic study, try to cope with the pressure and follow up with the progress that how the uni level education is. Uh, so uh, for uh, for all my from all the students who coming from poly polytechnic and you are coming to after especially when you finish your national service and you come to university year one uh i would really recommend you to spend more time and the focus on academic study because you really need to keep on because the year for the first year of university is really the to build your fundamental mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. if you fail to do this on your year one and the next two years are going to be really, really suffering for you. So uh, this is from my own personal experience speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, so in my year one, I did not, I did not do any co-curricular activities. But since starting from my year two, uh, I would like to like change my message because uh, it is for my year one is actually pretty boring because I only focus on the mechanic study and mm -hmm. it I did not meet other friends I did not have any activities so I started to look out for the emails in the uh, emails out of all the event page see which one I want to join so for my year two I have joined two events the first one is the uh, open house 2022 the second one is the student life fair so I've joined the organizing committee into this and I play a role in the uh, publicity uh, pub uh, publicity committee as well. So from then on, I know that uh, only for, uh, it's, it's, have, it's such such a nice experience to mm -hmm. have something to do other than active study. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, see, starting from the year two, I also became a resident, a resident assistant in EGPR. Mm -hmm. And also I tried to focus on uh, bringing, uh, making the life uh, of our resident more colorful and, make the, uh, and ensure their well-being in the uh, uh in, during in their stay in PGPR. So I would recommend for, for all the students who uh uh if you really uh, find the academic study in, in AUS stressful, you can actually just first you can try just focus on two things. You can try focus on your academic study, then you can just try to find another things are interested to. For example, CCAs, you can just draw one of the CCAs mm -hmm. or if you're interested, you can just uh, be a student leader in your, uh, in, in your halls, in your in your residences, or whatever your recognition is. Uh, so like, do not waste the three of three years in US because it's an opportunity to enrich yourself, to be a better person, and uh, to know more friends as well. Yeah. So this is my past two years of US study. What I learned from that. Thank, thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. You know that how you make your NUS education work, that is entirely up to you. It's a matter of making the right choice, you know, and do what you are comfortable with. And then after that, you, 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 you strengthen your foundation and you can branch out to do other things. And uh, I get you have anything to add about this? I think you wanted to say something. No, no. I leave it to the students to share first. Okay, and uh, the 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 other thing that you can really really you know enrich your studies is that uh, you know go for one of our student exchange program. And in fact, Natalie, she is now in uh, UK, and uh, in fact, uh, she she has, she has done some traveling as well, and uh, getting to have a different perspective. You know, you know, Natalie, uh, you know, for the past uh, two to three years. Uh, Due to COVID traffic restriction, many of our students didn't get to go for a study abroad program. For the now that the borders have reopened, this is an opportunity. So, how is it like studying in the UK, Natalie? Well, it's a completely different culture and environment, both academically and just in general. So, it really has been a privilege to go abroad for this semester. And it sounds so cliche because people say that exchange is like life changing, but the truth is, I feel like it really is. <laughs> so I really feel that the past like three months that I've been abroad have really broadened my horizons and have given mm -hmm. me the opportunity to really see the world and learn from other people as well. Yeah, so I think that everybody should try 
to go on at least like one of the global opportunities that NUS provides, be it like exchange programs or like summer school or winter school. There are many programs available. So you have plenty of time to go ahead and apply in your next few years of NUS. Yeah. Yes, that that that's really wonderful. You know that that uh, like like I said, you know, uh, life in NUS. Uh, yes, academy is one thing, but there are a lot of other things you can do, and uh, I I think some of the students now that you're looking at the 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 date, matriculation is going to come soon, and orientation is uh, the round down the corner, and uh, and also there are a lot of activities that is going on, and later on in next month. The registrar office is going to contact you and so on and so forth. So maybe I will invite uh, Meng Hui to talk a little bit about, you know, you always hear about red and flag that uh, the public talks about. And uh, what is this red and flag? And uh, maybe Meng Hui can share a little bit more. Yeah, so red and flag is an annual wide um, annual charity event. So basically on Rec Day, there will be different faculties and different halls of residences putting up a very vibrant um, dance performance for, to support the efforts of FLAG, which is a fun, well, fundraising part of Rec and FLAG. Yeah. So um, for halls and uh, faculties, there are Rec uh, trainings that actually start from... June, if I remember correctly. And basically, you can do either dancing or help out in the floats. So for dance, it'll be, you know, like the, <laughs> the usual very rara dancing. Um, and then for, for the floats, you'll be helping to paint, to build very large structures um, that you'll see on the stage itself. So all in all, it's about a two-month commitment when you participate in REC. And I think it's a very fun avenue to get to know many friends that you'll potentially be studying with, potentially be living with. And yeah, I think um, for a very meaningful cause as well. Mm -hmm. Do you make a lot of new friends uh, through these uh, red and flag events? Yeah, I did. So I actually joined uh, the Masik Hall REC back when I was freshman and I'm still friends with a lot of them till today actually um I think it was a very nice like experience getting to know the people before I actually um started staying in hall itself and through the experience I also got to see the facilities of the hall as well when I went there to um do the to to do dance um practices yeah so I think very fun Yes. <laughs> thank you. Th thank you. Thank you, Manhui, for the uh, sharing. So you can see that uh, we are now moving closer and closer towards registration and things like that. And uh, and they are, you know, your, your respective faculties will have a lot of briefing about module registration, about what to do. And, uh, and most importantly, you know, what to expect in the next few years of your NUS education. And, uh, you know, it has been a pleasure for me to uh, to be able to handle your admission, you know, to talk to you. I guess some of you when you were actually in JCs, and now it's time for me to actually pass all of you to the Dean of Students, Professor Ho, to actually take care of you for the next four years of your life and together with your respective faculties as well. So I will now in the interest of time, I'll just let uh, Prof Ho Say a few more words about your advice to the students and uh, and uh, what would you encourage them to do in the next four years? Thank you, please. Okay. Well, I, I will, I will uh, just conclude by kind of uh, rehashing what I have said right at the beginning, that I see student life, especially residential life, not simply as uh, something uh, that you're, need to do or need to have because you need a roof over your head. But it actually opened up another important set of experience that you will remember the university days for. Uh, in fact, for many people who have stayed on campus, uh, years later, they will say that the best part of the memories, and in fact, most of what they remember about their life in the university were things that took place within the hostel. 
So see this as an important uh, piece of the university that you can take away with you in addition to the paper qualification that you are going to add uh, to you're going to get. And in fact, it may be many years later that we'll, you will discover all the different subtle skills, experiences that will come back to, to uh, help you in different stages of your life. Yeah. So, so therefore, uh, I hope that uh, you, at this point, you keep an open mind. Uh, you don't have to, you know, be too fixated that if I don't get into this hostel, then nothing else for me. But keep an open mind to see what are all the options that are available for yourself. Uh, match that against your own preferences, your interests, and the type of lifestyle that you want to have. Yeah? And, and I think uh, there is no right option or wrong option. Importantly, you have to find something that you are comfortable with and not doing anything outside of the classroom, I don't think it's a good option. Yeah. So uh, that's all I will, I will share. And we are happy to engage with you if you have further questions. And you can always reach out to us via email or for any other face-to-face -face that events that we will have coming up. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you, Prof. I fully agree that there's no right or wrong option. There is only your choice. You know, mm -hmm. how you make it work, that is entirely up to you. And uh, thanks very much for staying all the way until 8.30. And uh, my colleagues and I warmly welcoming you to NUS. Back to you, Eunice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Prof. And students for sharing your experience, sites, and sound advice. I hope they have managed to answer your questions and clarify your doubts. With that, we have come to the end of the session. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that this webinar has been helpful. If you have any further questions, please send them through our Asset Admissions website. You may also visit the Office of Student Affairs portal for more information regarding residential and student life matters. We have appended these links in the chat box for your reference. We also greatly appreciate if you could please take a few minutes to fill up a feedback form. You may scan a QR code or access the link that we will be sharing soon. Your feedback is important to us, so please let us know how we can improve. Once again, thank you so much. My colleagues and I look forward to warmly welcoming you to NUS. Have a great evening.